This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Ido Lando, who is a professor of philosophy at Haifa University, and also the author, uh, most recently, of this book that I have right here. It's called Finding Meaning in an Imperfect world. So on this show, you know, we've covered a lot of ground. I've talked to folks about economics and psychology and biology and business strategy and data and so forth. Uh, today, we're going we're gonna to tackle the meaning of life, right? So it's just a little, uh, you know, a, a light topic. Um, but um, you cover a lot of ground in this book. Uh, and I think the main thrust of your argument is you're kind of calling for something analogous to a fallibilist approach to meaning which is uh, an anti-perfectionist viewpoint. Um, and I think that, you know, your, your arguments are rooted in philosophy, but I wanted to know, um, most people, I think, outside, if you're not a philosopher, they, they tend to think that this is something which is in the domain of, of psychology in the modern world. And so I, I wanted to start off by asking how philosophers think about the distinction between philosophy and psychology, right? And, and why is it that in the modern world, it seems that psychology has sort of taken over the role that philosophers and, and theologians may have had in the past? Right. I think that um, most uh, psychologists that deal with uh, issues in meaning in life um, are more interested in the subjective sphere. They talk about uh, feelings, emotions, sensations, and uh, philosophers are also interested in the objective sphere. So uh, when uh, I look at the psychological literature on meaning in life, it has a lot to do with uh, people's sensations. And a philosopher might ask whether people who feel that their lives are meaningful really have meaningful lives, or sometimes they feel that their lives are meaningless. Well, maybe they are wrong again. So uh, this wouldn't be very different from um, distinguishing between people's uh, feeling that they are moral and asking whether they are really behaving morally. Uh, that would be an important distinction for philosophers. They also ask about normative issues where most um, psychologists who deal with meaning in life are more interested in uh, descriptive questions. What influences people's uh, sensations? And some of the things that uh, influence people's sensations may not have to do very much with uh, issues of justification or appropriateness of this, uh, of this feeling. For example, it was found that um, if you show uh, people um, a series of cards that are more ordered and then give them some kind of a questionnaire that is supposed to measure the meaningfulness, the sensation of meaning in their life, the sensation that their life is meaningful is stronger. Okay, that's nice, but uh, it might be also helpful for people who feel that their lives are not meaningful. But philosophers are also interested in in the objective sphere of the discussion. Right, so I think, uh, I mean, you address a number of arguments that people make against uh, meaning in their lives. Um, and I guess part of what you're saying is that... Um, even though people, as you say, spend more time trying to figure out right, which movie to watch on a given night than they do explicitly thinking about, right, finding meaning in their lives, they're, they're, they're walking around as if they've made these arguments. And, and you uh, are saying, let's, let's surface these arguments that you are implicitly living by and, and let's address them explicitly right? You're, let's bring to the surface these, yes. these arguments. So, so, so people, um, I mean, obviously, you know, you're addressing philosophical arguments that have been articulated by philosophers like Schopenhauer, but, but, um, is it really the case you think that people are, um, you know, acting according to I implied arguments and that when you, you surface them, they'll kind of recognize them and say, yeah, okay, this, you're right. This is kind of an argument that I've been living by without even realizing it? 
Uh, according to my experience, yes, I've talked with uh, many people um, who complain to me that their lives are not meaningful. And um, we um, unearthed or, uh, mm -hmm. or uh, um, exposed uh, all sorts of uh, suppositions that they had. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, some people um, told me that they feel that their lives are not meaningful because they don't know what the goal of, of their life is. Mm -hmm. And uh, after we discussed that, and in the cases that I was able to convince them that maybe they don't have to have a comprehensive goal for their whole life uh, in order to have a meaningful life, some of them reported either at the end of the discussion or a week or two weeks later, that um, they are less troubled by this. So they feel better in that mm -hmm. sense. And they are um, uh, more um, at peace with, uh, with the issue of meaningfulness in their lives. Some others had uh, similar questions about, um, I don't know, death. The fact that one day they will uh, die and after some time they will be completely forgotten. And uh, the, the same holds for many other uh, pessimistic um, arguments against the meaning, uh, uh, against our having meaning in life or having meaningful lives. Um, I was surprised to see how many of uh, these arguments that some uh, philosophers uh, elaborated very meticulously are actually held in a more coarse way by many, many people who feel that their lives are not meaningful enough. Right, and I think the, the the major thrust of your argument in the book is that people are implicitly holding these perfectionist views, right? That, you know, if life cannot be fill in the blank X, some kind of perfect, perfect, perfect ideal, then it, it lacks meaning completely. Could you, you know, what, what are the various types of perfectionism that people are carrying around with them? Um. Well, uh, the, the general uh, thrust of uh, perfectionism generally is um, the, the view or the sensation that uh, if things are not excellent or perfect, and maybe if not perfect, still excellent, extre of extremely high quality, then they're not worth anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit like a person who looks into the sun and then is blinded because he cannot see mm -hmm anything that is in regular light. And um, some people um, discuss the meaninglessness or the perceived meaning meaninglessness of their lives uh, in, uh, in perfectionistic uh, terms um, explicit explicitly and directly. For example, they say that because um, they haven't uh, achieved the achievements of, I don't know, Mahatma Gandhi or uh, Rubens or Mozart or Einstein, mm -hmm. their lives are uh, not meaningful. But many of the other pessimistic arguments also have a perfectionist streak in them. So I think that some people who tell me that we think that their lives are not meaningful because they are not, uh, they are not infinite <laughs> or mm -hmm. eternal, one day they will die are in the background having this uh, uh, perfectionist um, uh, standard or presupposition. Some other people um, who use what is sometimes uh, known as the argument from uh, our cosmic insignificance. Uh, so this arguments, uh, argument or, or feeling uh, um, has to do with, with the notion that, well, we have some impact on our immediate surrounding today, um, but what about Alpha Centauri? <laughs> what about other mm -hmm. galaxies? We, we do not impact them. Again, here, I think in the background, we can detect a perfectionist um, uh, supposition. Only if I impact the whole universe, not, not only this galaxy, the whole universe, the whole cosmos, <laughs> can my life be meaningful? And in this case, it's not that if I'm not Rembrandt or Mozart or Mahatma Gandhi that my life is meaningless. It's if I'm not God Almighty, supposing that there is a God, my life is meaningless. Mm -hmm. Well, part of it, the first part you mentioned has to do with kind of competitive value, right? It's, it's almost, you know, part of our hedonic 
treadmill, right? That, you know, as soon as you achieve something, you see that there's someone else that's, you know, achieved something even greater. And so you aspire to that, right? Um, and you, you say that maybe one way to interpret that uh, critique that you're making is that the perfect is the, the enemy of the good, right? And that we should simply kind of satisfy and, and be happy with something that's, you know, good enough. But I, then I think I think you make a little bit more of a subtle point that, you know, you're not arguing against idealism, right? You're not arguing against aspiration. You're not arguing against um, goals and, and attempts to achieve greatness. You're just saying that, you know, um, you have to do this within reason, right? How, how, is, um, how is idealism different from perfectionism? Well, I think that both uh, perfectionists and non-perfectionists um, can have ideals and uh, both can um, do whatever they can to uh, realize these ideals and even excel and uh, go as far as they can. And uh, it's not always the case that more is better, but in the cases where more is better, mm -hmm. then they get more. All that is fine. This does not distinguish between the perfectionist and the non-perfectionist. I think the distinction is in, uh, in the perfectionist inability to enjoy also what is less than perfect. So mm -hmm. maybe we didn't achieve what is perfect. Maybe we're not like Einstein. Maybe, maybe we're, well, uh, in a much uh, lower grade. Can we still see the quality that there is in what we do and enjoy it and appreciate it and see that there is value there and there is meaningfulness there? Um, when we compare a perfectionist student to a non-perfectionist student, it is the same. Both think that, uh, I don't know, 95 or 100 <laughs> is better than, than 70 or 80 and both try to achieve it. But the perfectionist students, when they receive 98 or just 94, they, uh, they leave their studies because they're, they feel that they are nothings, they are zeros. Uh, if, I, if I didn't get 100 here, I'm in the wrong field. I, I shouldn't be doing this. And the non-perfectionist student would also enjoy and, and hopefully work hard in order to get a higher mark and maybe the best mark. But when what they achieve is less than perfect, but still good, then, then they can enjoy it and, and appreciate it. This is, I think, the, the key difference. Well, I think you mentioned also that there are similarities between perfectionism and narcissism and perfectionism and misanthropy, right? So perfectionistic people <laughs> then presumably, I mean, do, do they... Do they apply the same standard to others, uh, which is what makes them, uh, you know, misanthropic? But I think you, you also point out that some perfectionists uh, are inconsistent. In other words, they, they're more forgiving towards others than they are towards themselves, and they've, they hold themselves to a higher standard. And I think one of the things you recommend is that you step outside of yourself and, you know, look at yourself the way you would kind of view uh, another person, right? Right. That surprised me immensely when I talked with uh, people who thought that their lives were meaningless um, because they were perfectionists. Um, they applied the perfectionist standard only to themselves. And they told me that they think that they are zeros, nothings. Uh, some of them use even more radical terms mm -hmm. about themselves uh, and that their lives are meaningless. Maybe there is no real justification for them to continue to live. And when I ask them whether this is also how they judge their uh, siblings, parents, children, friends, they were surprised to, uh, to notice in, in almost all cases, not all cases, but in almost all cases, that um, they do not judge uh, other people as harshly. And this is a case of, I think, inconsistency. If uh, my life isn't worth anything because uh, I'm not uh, Immanuel Kant, then also other people's lives, well, when they're not Immanuel Kant, um, uh, are not worth anything as well. They too lead meaningless lives. Mm -hmm. 
And um, it is very interesting for me to see that um, many people, so to say, discriminate against themselves. This is not the way we usually think about discrimination. Usually discrimination is, um, well, I use double standards and I treat uh, myself or my group more favorably mm -hmm. than I treat other groups. But here there is some kind of a reverse discrimination, if it can, if, if the term makes sense. I uh, treat myself, I judge myself much more harshly than I judge other people. And I saw that uh, time and again. People were surprised when I, I suggested that this is the case. Mm -hmm. Well, is, I mean, is there any way to get rid of interpersonal comparisons? I mean, a lot of economists and psychologists that I talk to will say, look, this is so hardwired, this desire to compare oneself to others that, um, you know, you can't eliminate it, but what you can do is you can kind of um, be selective about the pond in which you you swim, right? And so you can de-emphasize the, the comparisons that kind of make you look inferior <laughs> and start emphasizing the ones that kind of make you yeah, look look better, right? You can kind of reverse engineer what's important to match what it is that you bring to the table. Um, but isn't that, isn't that kind of a form of of self deception in a way? I mean, it's is 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 that type of I don't know self deception or you know manipulation of your perspective uh, antithetical to the philosophical act enterprise? Uh, I would think that. Um... Um, the business of philosophy is the pursuit of truths. So uh, we should not try to cheat ourselves or delude ourselves. Um, sometimes we can try to change uh, the way that we look at things if we think that this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, competitiveness can be changed. I think that culturally also, some cultures are more competitive than others. And uh, in my own country, um, I've seen through several decades uh, the competitive values uh, rising mm -hmm. with uh, good results and bad results. Um, I think that there are also differences between people, and this might have to do also with uh, genetics, but I think it also has to do with education, both at school and at home. And I'm a great believer in people's educating themselves. Also, uh, I know some people who um, um, became less competitive after they thought about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, of course, um, I perfectly agree. We, we are in, in a very strong way wired into some, some degree of competitivism uh, or competitiveness. Um, but um, I think... Uh, it is not the same in all people, mm -hmm. and there is um, there is a range of uh, of uh, um, ability to increase or decrease it. Right, and I, you, I think you you make some reference to positive psychology, right, which is a big movement, and you know, it, I I think there's there's obviously some similarities with what positive psychology is doing, and maybe. Uh, the philosophy of meaning, but I think they're, they're very different projects, right? Because, you know, identifying the things that make you happy doesn't necessarily tell you why happiness ought to be a goal in the first place. Right. And philosophy is, is, is about, right, right. you know, telling you, you know, what, what goal is worth pursuing, not, you know, assuming that you're supposed to pursue the goal that makes you feel good or, or, or makes you happy. Right. Can, can, can being unhappy, yep. Uh, be uh, you know a, a goal in one's life. Can can one find meaning in in, in unhappiness and and suffering? Right? Um, is there is there any reason why we should preference being happy over you know being unhappy? Um, well, I think that uh, um, happiness uh, can be seen as um, um, of intrinsic value. I mean, there is good reason to be happy just for the sake of happiness. However, um, that does not mean that happiness and meaningfulness always come together. Many times they do come together. There are many cases in which increasing ha happiness also increases meaning in life or the meaningfulness of one's life. 
and uh, suffering, pain, sadness can um, gnaw away the, the meaningfulness. Um, often to have a meaningful life, uh, one needs to work or to invest and give attention to this. And when one is uh, suffering, sometimes one does not have this uh, energy or, or attention to give to meaningfulness. However, it is, um, uh, I think, wrong to identify uh, between them. And there are cases in which uh, we see lives that are completely or, well, highly unhappy, mm -hmm. but still meaningful. So one famous example um, was suggested by uh, the Austrian uh, psychotherapist, uh, logotherapist, Viktor Frankl. He suggested that uh, some inmates in the World War II concentration camps, not all of them, actually a minority of them, did succeed in maintaining the meaningfulness of their lives in the camps. Now, of course, they were not happy because they were starved and frightened and tortured and, and, hung, and uh, they, they were worried about their relatives and so on. Um, but still, it is possible. Um, in a completely different setting, um, uh, in my own experience, I, um, well, um, I, I took a course um, that um, more or less prepared me to practice what might be called lay chaplaincy with uh, terminally sick cancer patients. Mm -hmm. So I, um, um, after the course, I uh, went uh, um, to, to see terminally ill cancer patients and I, so to say, walk them to their deaths, accompany them till they died. And of course, um, this does not in uh, any way, um, 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 allow me to make these people happy because they're going to die soon and they are in pains and, um, they uh, sometimes cannot move and they're in diapers and sometimes their family does not come to visit them. And what I used to tell them time and again is, look, I cannot make this uh, uh, into a happy situation, but uh, maybe together we can make this into a meaningful mm -hmm. situation. We cannot have your happiness, but we can have your meaning. Now, there are also cases in which I think people diminish happiness, consciously diminish happiness in their order to attain meaningfulness. For example, um, I think that, um, um, for example, Nelson Mandela could have chosen uh, to, um, to leave South Africa mm -hmm. and um, um, then his life, I think, would have been happier because he spent so many years in prison. It would have been happier, but less meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, um, a Soviet dissident called Andrei Sakharov, who um, was um, a very famous uh, scientist there. He had to do with uh, the USSR's uh, nuclear armament. And at a certain point, he decided to, to become a dissident. And he knew very well that uh, that would make his life um, much less happy. And he paid with happiness, consciously. Mm -hmm. He was aware of that. He paid with, with um, happiness in order to increase meaning in his life. So yes, these are uh, different things. And in some cases, um, um, there is a positive correlation between happiness and meaningfulness. And um, in some cases, uh, no, on the contrary. Well, I think there's sort of a, a folk philosophy that is uh, that says that, you know, all of the good things kind of align with one another. You know, it's kind of this eudaimonistic view. Maybe it goes back to John Locke uh, or even further, right? That, you know, if you are doing the right thing, if you're uh, doing the meaningful thing, then it'll naturally result in some kind of, of happiness. And in the U.S., 
we have uh, a shared belief that we all have the right to pursue happiness and and it's prioritized uh, certainly there's there's nothing in any of our founding documents that says that you know pursuit of meaning is is, is what we're supposed to be after um so when one is happy how does one know you know that cuz i think if you're a philosopher and you see someone who's happy um, but it's, they're not, uh, living a life of meaning. You would say, well, that's kind of a fake happiness or a false happiness. Some people would say, um, so if, if one is, if one is, um, pursuing happiness, how does one know that they're pursuing kind of this false happiness or this meaningless happiness, as opposed to something that is, uh, more meaningful? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that meaningless happiness is, is false happiness. Uh, it is, uh, well, uh, I agree that uh, um, people like Aristotle and people who accept the um, eudaimonistic view would accept, would uh, believe that. But if we talk about um, subjective happiness, I think that people can be very happy, um, but um, in the sense that they have a contented sensation most of the time, they are pleased with what's happening pleasures from here to eternity um but uh, um this would uh, lack meaning so in some cases we we may think about um i know there is this um, um notion of the empty playboy um who has um, fun the whole day but uh, there's nothing of sub substance there mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, the person himself would sense that there is something empty here, that there is not enough value in one's life, uh, in, in uh, um, uh, the pleasurable life. And sometimes they won't. And we might think that, uh, yes, it is, uh, it is happy, it is pleasant, but... Um, this is not what we would like um, our, uh, this is not the way of life that we would wish our children to have, or we wouldn't like our lives to be like that. Because there's a not enough value. We're not seeking probably only happiness. I'm still talking now about subjective happiness. Um, we are also in a, in a very strong way seeking I think meaningfulness. Now you point out that some religions have built in um, ideas that allow people to be less than perfect, right? And you know, this this I found interesting because you know, I, way I was raised, um, you know, the the view was that if you know you, you're supposed to aspire to be a saint, right? You know, you aspire to be, you know, Jesus or <laughs> you know something, you know, re really aspirational. And but you say that you know, most religions have baked in this difference between kind of precepts and counsels. And, and you even refer to the, the, the Hasidic view that, you know, mediocrity is, you know, is, is, is a virtue. Um, now that doesn't sound right, but, but the way you articulate it, right. These, these, these Benonim, right. The Benonim are the, you know, the, the good enough people, right. It's okay it's, to be good enough. Right. Could, could you articulate? Cause this is, I think, mm -hmm. you know, most people think that, that yes. religions are, um, you know, very idealistic and, and perfectionistic. Yes. Um, I think that, uh, many religions, uh, uh discuss, uh, perfectionist ideals as a uh, super arrogatory. So this is beyond, uh, uh, beyond duty. If you do it, this is wonderful. You're a saint, but not everyone has to be a saint. And um, you can enter uh, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, you can be um, um, a very, very good um, uh, religious person if you just do the regular duties. Uh, I think that in Hasidism, they uh, they emphasized it, um, especially uh, in, in some branches of Hasidism, they emphasized it by um, choosing a term that, especially to the modern ear, sounds uh, depreciating, which is mediocre. We usually use the term mediocre mm -hmm. when we actually mean to say bad. Mm -hmm. um, but they wanted to emphasize that uh, 
one shouldn't try to, well, poison one's life by trying to achieve what is almost impossible. Mm-hmm. And um, um, continuing to do the regular duties, religious duties, and um, um, which, by the way, are sufficient burden in themselves. And succeeding in that, that is enough. Not going further is sometimes even better because in some cases, the efforts to go very far can lead to um, poisoning or even destroying what you already have. Now, um, it is interesting that you said good enough because I think this is true also in other uh, non-religious mm-hmm. traditions. So um, uh, the psychologist uh, Donald Winnicott had this term, uh, this notion, of the good enough mother. Mm-hmm. He noticed that um, many mothers feel very guilty for not being perfect. Um, I, I myself do not believe in God. I respect people who believe in God. But if we think about belief in God as, well, God as a myth, I think that another myth, maybe even stronger, is the perfect mother myth. In the, the mother that is never, um, now we would say, a parent, I think. Um, uh, a parent uh, who, who is never angry or exhausted or impatient or um, just sometimes even hates the baby. And um, he stressed very much that it is important to be not a perfect mother, a good enough mother who does what is necessary and uh, keeps um, uh, her baby uh, fed and safe and a few other things. And then you can have also many faults. It's okay. I think this is true also of many other aspects of um, meaning in life, way, the, ways we, the way we judge ourselves in parenthood and in religion and in our well, um, academic achievements, if we're academics, uh, um, our ability to understand or enjoy art, if we create art, the level of art that we create, in all these cases, there, I think there, there, there is a big danger of poisoning our lives and, and feeling that we are not worth anything and our lives are just a burden when we're perfectionists. Now, I think you, you also kind of tackle this view that since life is, is finite and since our accomplishments are so meager, that this, um, you know, degrades the meaningfulness of our lives. And, you know, you use the analogy of, of, of floor sweeping, right? I, and I guess, you know, this is a, a more relatable um, yeah. metaphor than, you know, Sisyphus pushing pushing the stone up the slope, right? Because we, we all engage in this activity, you know. I right. mean, right after this call, I'm going to have to go down and, you know, empty the dishwasher and, and reload the dishwasher. And I probably do this three times a day and, and the dishes sure. never stop. Um, but, but I do, I do actually find some meager meaning in this. And, and, you know, I wonder, is, is that just my deceiving myself, uh, and suppressing any, um, any perspective that would put this in context, right? You know, and if you, if you, if you think about it too hard, right, you could, essentially find it meaningless. But I think what you're arguing is that if you think about it, you know, hard, but in the right way, you can, you can find meaning in the the mundane and in the, uh, in the transitory. So how how can one do that? Because I I, I think most people suppress any thoughts of the futility of what it is they're engaging in. Um, I think that uh, when we see the importance of the mundane activities, including repetitive uh, activities, including activities that, um, well, um, uh, you invest uh, some work in what you do and you have have some results, but they vanish after some time. 
I mean, you sweep the floor and after some time, after, after some time, it's dirty again. You wash the dishes or put them in the dishwasher and tomorrow they will be uh, 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 dirty again. Um, there might be some kind of a perfectionist supposition that only what is uh, non-transient is valuable. And uh, I think it's very important to get rid of this uh, supposition. I think that there are good reasons to believe that um, many transient things are valuable. Um, and that is true also of the good deeds that, uh, that we do. And um, I don't know, moments of bliss, for example. You, you see a beautiful view or you have uh, several uh, moments of great warmth with someone. Um, you feel very close, uh, or you have this excellent insight or great aesthetic enjoyment when you hear some music. It's not forever, but it is highly valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, we can also try to think about it in eternal terms or infinite terms, so to say. When we say, look, um, it will pass, you also will pass, maybe it will be forgotten, well, not maybe, it will be forgotten someday when there will not be any more people on this planet, no one will know about it, but the fact that you did a good deed or that you had this uh, peak experience, the fact will remain true forever, even if no one will know about it. So that's one option, but um, this in a way tries uh, again, to to save save the day by looking at eternity or infinity, and that's not the direction that uh, I'm interested in. Even if we accept, I'm not sure that we should accept, but even if we accept that what is transient, what is passing, what will be finished, and had had a beginning and and will have an end, is is not as good as what is eternal. Maybe our life would be more meaningful if it would if it were eternal. I'm not sure that's true. And maybe the this moment of bliss or fifteen minutes of bliss, maybe it would be better if they if they were here forever. I'm, again, I'm not sure about that either. But even if we accept that, uh, it would have been better if uh, all these good things were not finite. This does not mean that they're worthless when they're finite. They, per supposition, they have less value, less meaningfulness than they would have if they were infinite. But still they have serious value. They are very important. We can be very happy about them and we should appreciate their value, I, I suggest. So don't you when, you, when you walk past your bookshelves and you notice all the books that you're, you're never gonna read and, you know, you, you, you look at the map and you see all the, the countries you're, you're never going to visit, right? How do you, how do you, um, how do you make yourself feel good about that? Well, I try to uh, think uh, not only about what I have not done and will never do, but also about what uh, I have done and maybe mm -hmm. will do. And um, um, I think that um, we sometimes, per perhaps in our society, which is very achievement oriented, and as you said earlier, competitive, we're uh, always thinking about what we mm. didn't achieve and will never achieve. And maybe we feel too interested uh, um, about what other people achieved and too frustrated about the fact that some people achieved more than us. Um, I think that we can also try to direct ourselves consciously because um, perhaps because of cultural reasons and perhaps because of other reasons. Some people, many people don't do that enough, but I think we can direct ourselves to what we did do, what we did achieve what we did understand. And I think these things have a lot of value. In a way, this might be another, another version 
of the um, cosmic uh, insignificance argument. I mean, I, I did not impact uh, any, any, anything in, uh, in another galaxy. Actually, I did not impact anything in this galaxy almost, and on Earth as well. <laughs> I, I have a direct impact on, on very few things and very few people. But here, if I had some good impact, wow, that's a lot. That's very much. And it is also good to think about what I have done. Well, um, you also argue that um, a teleological view, right, can be, can be harmful, right? I think most people, when they think about meaning, they, they think in terms of, you know, having some, some telos, right. Or some purpose, but you point out the danger of that view, right. Which is that if you, if you push that argument, right. You know, you say, well, okay, why, why are you doing this? And then why, why are you doing, <laughs> why do you have that reason? And so forth, you know, you, you can, you can push it to the point where ultimately, you know, you're, you're going to find there's, there's no, there's no solid ground, right. There's no turtles all the way down that you'll ever find. And, and so, you know, maybe ha the need for, for a telos is, is, uh, is misguided. C could you, could you elaborate on that a, a bit? Like, cause that, that does seem to be, you know, people, when they think about meaning that they're thinking about some kind of, you know, ultimate meaning or, or some, some meaning that's, that's indisputable or grounded in, in some solidity somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, I think that, uh, there um there are ends to some of the things that we do uh that are meaningful i don't think that we always need ends in order to have meaningfulness or value so there are cases in which without uh, posing um, any ends any goals to ourselves and achieving these goals we have valuable experiences for example i might uh, you know, take the bus and look through the window and see some beautiful scenery. And I may happen to talk with someone and, and uh, then there is a great insight. Um, as uh, I just suggested, it is very important to um, allow ourselves to appreciate or value the value that we have. And this sometimes happens also when we do not set goals to ourselves. But even if we, even when we accept uh, tele teleology, even when we think about goals and we pursue goals, that's a very feasible way to try to make our lives meaningful. Uh, I think we should remember that um, um, in value theory as well, it is very common to accept that, that um, um, teleological chains or instrumental chains, functional chains are not infinite and they do not even have to be very long. So in value theory, it is very common to distinguish between instrumental value and intrinsic value or final value. There are distinctions between these terms. Um, intrinsic value and final value are not exactly the same, but it's not uh, sufficiently important uh, for us now to distinguish between them. Uh, it is commonly believed that there are many things that we do and that um, um, or take part in that are valuable not because they serve any other um, end beyond them, but they are the end. And that's perfectly well. There's, there's no problem here. Um, so... Um, some people seem to think that since they cannot continue the, the teleological chain forever or because it does not reach some kind of an absolute uh, end or, or basis for the whole thing, there is a problem. Um, Jean Ponsard, for example, thought that this is the case. But um, most theorists now I do not accept this view. So... Um, Let's take something that does not have to do with uh, meaning necessarily. Um, I don't know. Um, I am um, walking to the store. Why am I walking to the store? Well, what is the goal? Well, I want to buy their candy. 
why do I want to buy candy? Um, to eat the candy. And why do I want to eat the candy? For what purpose? Yes, what is the end of this? To have enjoyment. And why do I want to have enjoyment? Then the reply is just to have enjoyment. The value of enjoyment is in the enjoyment. Now, maybe I will also Wait, think... Do you, do you actually stop? Do you actually... Do you actually stop at that point <laughs> as a philosopher? Don't you keep going? Definitely. The point is that we'll stop here. Yes. So um, mm. um, maybe I can go on another step if I'll try very hard. Well, why do I want to, to have this enjoyment? Maybe I found out that after I enjoy myself, I work better. Okay. And why do you want to work better? <laughs> Soon it will end. And all teleological chains end. Why do I pray to please God? Why please God? I don't know. That's the end. The value of pleasing God is <laughs> in the act itself. And this is true of many, many things, including meaning in life. Why do I want to have meaning in life? Because it is very valuable. There is intrinsic value here. <laughs> And uh, it is not considered uh, problematic at all, the fact that, uh, that these chains end, because some activities have intrinsic values. Uh, 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 the value of, of now, what are... some activities is intrinsic, not extrinsic. They do not serve anything. Mm -hmm. now, now, when one studies science, right, and learns more about causation, Right. So whether it's evolutionary biology or whether it's, um, you know, neuroscience, one starts to see that behavior, thoughts, beliefs and so forth are caused by these underlying processes. And there may be more determinism and chance than, you know, we believe in our kind of folk uh, models of, of human behavior and causation. Does, does this serve as, does this typically cause people to um, lose meaning when they become aware of this? Is, does this pose a, a threat in some way to the, the philosophical enterprise that we, we are all engaging in? Um, I think that many people are, are worried about that. Uh, many laypersons are extremely worried about that. Um, and uh, some philosophers are worried about that, and there is a lot of interesting discussion about that. So one way to cope with the deterministic, uh, pessimistic challenge to life's meaningfulness is uh, to deny determinism. So some philosophers are determinists and some philosophers are libertarians. And there are also some other uh, positions which uh, sometimes allow um, uh, degrees of freedom. So that's uh, one strategy. That's one direction in which uh, people try uh, to cope with the deterministic uh, challenge. Uh, another direction, um, which I found I find uh, also very interesting, uh, is to say, look, maybe maybe we don't have autonomy. Maybe we don't have freedom. But is is it clear that this makes life meaningless? Now, if we think that meaningfulness has a lot to do with value, then I think that when we reflect about it a bit, we um, find out that there are many things that we can still value under deterministic uh, presuppositions. A philosopher um, uh, called Dirk Pergum uh, worked a lot on this, published very interesting uh, work on this. And... Um, Okay, let me try to give some examples. Uh, I'll, I'll start uh, with, uh, with the weaker ones and, and then proceed on. Um, sometimes we think, well, we value things that came without, uh, without choice, such um, as, uh, I don't know, a guy or someone got inheritance without trying to, to get this inheritance and now they're rich. Okay, maybe that's not exactly meaning in life. Let's talk about another thing which might be seen as valuable, which is beauty. Most of us did not um, did not choose autonomously to be beautiful. 
And we still appreciate, we value beauty very much. Still, maybe this is not exactly meaningfulness, but I'll, I'll go on from here. I just want to mention that when people become more beautiful because of choice, for example, when they have all sorts of operations in order to be more beautiful, we even value this less than we do the natural beauty. So mm -hmm. let's talk about other things that are of value and which we do not choose. Um, well, let's talk about sports. I think that some of the people that we admire so much uh, in the Olympic Games, for example, also so runners, some of them clearly have the genetic, the, the mm -hmm. ge genetic uh, uh, um, uh, input that helps them to do that. And in some other cases, for example, in, uh, in the case of uh, those uh, um, two wonderful uh, tennis players, um, um, the Williams sister, sisters, um, they both, I think, had a very strong uh, genetic advantage here, but also their father from a very, very early age, more or less, um, well, a cultured or brainwashed them to, to be very good tennis players. He did not leave them a lot of choice and still many people admire them. Okay, maybe some people think that sports does not have to do with meaning in life. So let's talk about Mozart. In many lists of, uh, we'll give some general example, token examples of, uh, of people whose lives were meaningful, Mozart appears there. Now it is clear that he had great musical talent. Um, he came from, from a family of people who, who were inclined to music. And he was also brought up from a very early age to be um, a great musician. It is not clear that, that um, he, he had much choice here. That may be also true of uh, some great um, painters, um, some great poets, uh, uh, fiction uh, writers. Some of them don't talk about choosing. Some of them use metaphors like the muse wrote through me. Some say that they cannot, cannot do it otherwise. Maybe some of them are even um, suffer from some kind of obsession for compulsiveness as some great mathematicians and scientists, uh, uh, as might be true of also some great mathematicians or scientists. And still we, we have a lot of respect for them. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let's, as a thought of experiment, compare two people. One of them is Shakespeare, and let's say that Shakespeare couldn't but write the things that he wrote because um, it burnt in him. He, 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 he would have been restless, suffering if he didn't sit down and write Hamlet and, and King Lear. Now, let's talk about another guy who lived there at that time and did choose but he wrote worse stuff. Whom would we admire more? Whose life would we take to be meaningful? I think that most people would uh, take Shakespeare's life. I mean, this is not the historical biographical Shakespeare. We don't know anything about him. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that this is the biographical Shakespeare, um, mm -hmm. but the Shakespeare of these thought experiments or, or experiment or, or example. I think most of us would think that Shakespeare had a more meaningful life than this other person who, who chose and thought and deliberated and very autonomously decided to write whatever he wrote, and it wasn't very good. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure that, that uh, determinism, if we accept it, and maybe we shouldn't accept it, but if we accept it, I'm not sure that determinism ruins life's meaning. I think we can still accept that life is meaningful under deterministic suppositions. Well, but even if they're uh, living the kind of life that we might describe as meaningful, they themselves may not perceive it as, as meaningful. So to what extent is this about finding meaning and to what extent is it about making meaning? I think in the beginning of your book, you, you, you distinguish them. Um, right. how, I mean, should we, should we be thinking of meaning as 
you know, existing under the rocks and, and, uh, you know, all we have to do is overturn the rocks and we'll, we'll, we'll find it in there. Or is it, you know, look around and you'll, you'll find it in, in your garden and, and, uh, and ever, you know, the, the sort of Hemingway view, the Herman Hess view, the Ingmar Bergman view, or is it, um, you know, we, we have to go out there and, and make it right. We have to, uh, you know, create it out of, out of thin air, right. Like artists, right. The more right. kind of Nietzschean view, right. Are these views com compatible or, or are these very different ways of thinking about meaning? Um, I think that these are different ways of thinking about me meaning, but they're compatible ways and they, uh, complement each other. So, um, um, if to use uh, a metaphor, let's say that we want to feel more beauty in our house, to enjoy the beauty in our house more. We can do it in two ways. One of them is to introduce beauty into our house. We can change the furniture if it's ugly and change the carpets and the, and the pictures and um, get rid of some of them and uh, get new ones, which will be more beautiful. And another way of experiencing more beauty in our house is to de-trivialize um, the beauty that is already there. Because the beautiful picture that is on the wall has become, usually for most people, has become transparent, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, after a few weeks. We don't see it anymore. And... Uh, we can make ourselves aware of this beauty if we try to do that. Now, in the literature on meaning of life, this, these different ways of doing it can be called, uh, well, achievement, the way of achieving or the way of recognizing. So we can try to achieve value or achieve meaningfulness in the sense that um, we learn and then we know and we try to develop perhaps uh, loving relationships and um, go places and um, try to um, 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 develop uh, the moral um, or moral activity. This would change our lives in the sense that we will create or even introduce meaning into our lives. But another way of, of making our lives more meaningful is uh, to become aware of the meaning that is already there. Now, it is amazing, I think, that so many of us are unaware of the immense value that we already have. And we usually become aware of it only when it is gone. And the sorrow that we feel afterwards may be an indication to to the extent in which uh, to the extent to which it was valuable for us. But um, uh, until it's gone, or at least endangered, most of us are are not aware of it. And uh, when I talk with people who who see their lives as meaningless. I, I suggest these two directions. So one of them is indeed to work. Um, in, in some groups or places, um, I'm asked to typify myself and I sometimes reply, well, I'm a working person. And by that, I do not mean that uh, I'm working uh, in order that there would be bread and butter on the table, although that is also true, I'm, I'm not a millionaire. But I mean that in order to have a meaningful life, I work. I, I am uh, a meaningful life or meaning in life is not like a degree or a citizenship. You do something, you get it, and then you have it for your life. It's more like a love affair. You, you have to continue to work for this. And, and I work. Um, and I'm surprised that some people who see their lives as meaningless are are angered when I explain that they have to work for it. You have to work for other valuable things in life, so you have to work also for meaningfulness. So that is one direction. And that is the direction of, of finding. You have to think what would make your life more meaningful. And there are all sorts of questions you can ask yourself. 
in order to help yourself to know what would make your life more meaningful. And, and then you have to go in and do some things. But the other direction, um, that would be the direction of allowing yourself to see the value that is already there. So sometimes people have some kind of, of a, a good love affair or a good love in their life, but for some reason, they are numb to it. Mm -hmm. they, we, we, in general, I think, have a problem of numbness to value. We, so to say, close our eyes to it and we do not appreciate it as we should and as we can. Again, this is also a kind of work. It's a different kind of work. It's the work of sharpening our sensitivity to value or uh, trying to, fa to fight uh, our tendency to desynthesize mm -hmm. uh, value and resynthesize ourselves to value. And that is the, the, um, that is finding meaning and the earlier way is, is making meaning. So I think we should try, most of us should try both to make life more meaningful and to find the meaning that there is in life. Um, very often people who, who make their lives more meaningful very quickly afterwards, sometimes because of competitiveness or because of overachievement, uh, very quickly after they achieved value and meaning in life, it becomes transparent to them. Mm -hmm. It is very helpful to work also on, on resynthesizing ourselves to, to the value that already is there. Um, it is like, uh, some people with whom I talk are, are like a person who is, who, who can't pay the rent because they forgot that they had another bank account with a lot of money there or mm -hmm. that there, uh, there are some treasures in the attic um, and they can use that. Um, um, and um, um, the, the way of recognizing meaning is, is more um, ignored, it is less developed in the literature than the way of achieving value or making life meaningful. And I think it's a pity because for many people, most problems would be solved if they only became aware, not, not theoretically, but, but um, in, a, in a more presencing way of the value that, that already is there. Now, there, there is a fear in some people that if they'll be too content with the value that there already is there, they would not try to achieve more value. So first, I'm not sure that this would be such a big problem, but experience, uh, indeed, my limited experience with, with people with whom I talked, everything here is anecdotal. Uh, but I did talk about these issues with many, many people. Um, um, many people who, who uh, have developed in the, in the direction of, um, recognizing value, have more energy or happiness or readiness to also achieve more value. There is something frustrating in the knowledge, sometimes, uh, not, not uh, completely explicit knowledge that I'll work very hard for more value and then it will disappear again because I want to be able to, to, to recognize it. Mm -hmm. Recognizing is a very, very helpful direction. Well, you, I think you're fundamentally an optimist, right? Because you, you talk about the importance of deliberation. You say, look, if you want to find more meaning in life, then you have to, you have to deliberate, you have to work at it, you have to pay attention. But, you know, there's a whole nother tradition in, in philosophy and literature, which says that, you know, once you start kind of deliberating and once you start noticing and once you start paying attention then you'll actually start to undermine the things that you think are meaningful right you know you'll wind up like yes. tolstoy in the in the pit right? you know mm -hmm. licking honey off the twig while the little <laughs> ants try to yes. try to you know eat the eat the twig off right um so is is that is that just due to your 
disposition or uh, is, is there a danger that, you know, people, when they, they stop acting unconsciously and they start, um, you know, they put the divertissement on hold and, and they, they might actually find less meaning, right? How, how can you kind of encourage people to embark on this, this journey of, of deliberation um, and assure them that this will, will probably <laughs> result in, in this kind of discovery rather than, um, you know, leading to some kind of despair? Right. So, um, indeed, it is very common uh, in uh, pessimistic uh, uh, philosophy to um, paint or present uh, optimists as um, you know, some kind of fools. Um, they they just have a good mood and they're not uh, they're not aware of the bad things in life. And um, if they'll think about it deeply enough and seriously enough, if they'll be rational and look at all the evidence, then they'll join uh, they'll join us, the pessimists. And um, this is certainly not the view of the optimists. They think that um, again, on rational grounds only, and basing on se- themselves on evidence. Uh, there are very good arguments, uh, which I try to present also in the book. Um, uh, there are very good arg- arguments, and there is strong evidence for the optimistic view of life. And um, um, the, the, there are some optimists who are fools. There are also some pessimists who are fools. Some optimists uh, just go with the crowd. There are also some pessimists that just go with the pessimist crowd. Uh, earlier I said that um, that uh, the business of philosophy is the pursuit of truth, and I think this is certainly true also here. So uh, um, my, my and other optimists' um, uh, business is not to try to make people um, ignore the bad parts of life. Um, it is to think both about the bad parts and the good parts and the way we can perhaps change some things. And, um, and I think, I suggest that the arguments, uh, the optimistic arguments are strong enough to show that life can be meaningful. Now, I, I want to, uh, emphasize the difference between the pessimistic uh, the traditional pessimistic view and the traditional optimistic view. The, the pessimistic uh, traditional view is more, so to say, chauvinistic. Here, I don't mean, of course, male chauvinistic or nationally chauvinistic. Um, uh, I'm using the term chauv- chauvinistic in the sense that um, uh, pessimists, uh, the, the pessimist thesis is that life cannot cannot be meaningful for anyone, ever. Now, optimists present a much moderate thesis. They do not say that life must be good or is necessarily good for everyone, forever. They say that for some people, they think usually also for many people, life is meaningful, or if it is not meaningful, with some work, it could be made mm. into a meaningful life, but uh, but not uh, not for all people, mm-hmm. not for all people. Um, uh, Frankel, by the way, thought that all people's lives are meaningful. Mm. Uh, many optimists do not share this, maybe overly mm-hmm. optimistic view. Um, so, uh, be- because moderate philosophical claims are usually stronger to defend, I think we we have an advantage. Um, I think in general, we should remember that life is terrible and life is wonderful. It includes horrific things and it includes very good and wonderful things. Mm -hmm. And many people, not all people, but many people have quite a lot of power to um, live their lives in ways in which there is more meaningfulness or good than meaninglessness mm-hmm. or, or bad. 
Um, and their lives too, because we're not perfectionists, if we're, if we are not perfectionist optimists, but most optimists are not perfectionists. And in the meaningful lives, there is all, there are also segments of non-meaningfulness or actually meaninglessness and, and suffering and sorrow, but all in all, the optimists would say there is enough in, in many cases, and in some cases where there is not enough, there could be made enough meaningfulness to have all in all a meaningful life. Mm -hmm. So last question in your book, you reference a lot of literary works, um, cinematic works, right? Essays. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think that if they're going to do philosophy, they have to read philosophy. Um, perhaps you don't need that, right? Uh, there's philosophy that's embedded in literary works, right? Um, to what extent do we, should we, you know, dissolve these boundaries between philosophy and, uh, you know, reflective essay writing and, and literature and cinematography, right? Presumably one can imbibe the arguments you're making without having them be made explicit and without being turned into, you know, propositional logic, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, in philosophy, there are, there are different uh, traditions and different branches. Um, the, the method in which uh, I wrote and presented the book does not uh, try to logically formalize the arguments, but still I um, uh, followed um, what is what might be called the broadly analytic tradition in philosophy in, 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 uh, in uh, presenting arguments all the time. And um, uh, the arguments are thus open to criticism, which is the way I think philosophy should be practiced. And uh, I think that some of these criticisms were presented and then replies were, were uh, um, suggested and so on and so forth. Now, um, the, the literature, indeed I, I rely on a lot of literature, is uh, subsidiary. Mm -hmm. Um, if I erased uh, uh, all references to, to literature from the book, it should be as strong uh, argumentatively, I think. But um, uh, also because uh, I personally like literature very much, um, uh, I wanted to present some literary examples. More than that, I think that we can find a lot of wisdom in literature. Now, this wisdom is expressed in non-argumentative ways, usually. And uh, we should uh, treat it as philosophers also with suspicion. We should try to see whether, the, where, whether there are uh, presuppositions here that we might disagree with, whether um, um, we can make, um, work, um, um, w whether we can um, try to develop what we find in literature into valid, sound arguments, we should do all that. We shouldn't just say, yeah, well, you see, um, Tolstoy said this and that. We should criticize when we should criticize. But um, I think that as philosophers, we can gain a lot if we heed what authors of poetry and literature suggest to us. Mm -hmm. um, and I am sorry that um, a lot of philosophers are not interested in that at all. I think there is much to gain from this. Not blindly, not uh, overly admiringly, but but um, with uh, a critical mind, I think we have much to gain from this. Well, Ido, thank you so much for uh, joining me. The book is Finding Meaning in an Imperfect World, which is certainly the world that we live in. Uh, I enjoyed the book, and there's lots, of, uh, <laughs> uh, lots more to the book and many more arguments that we barely touched on. So thanks for joining me. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 